7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. In the radio studios of America, the technicians, the entertainers, the commentators, the administrative personnel daily unite their efforts in the creation of programs to please and entertain the vast radio public. Did you think about this class? Crazy music, you man. Did you uh, dig the rebound? Clear back to the hear how it sounds. Listen, Sonny, you don't own that song. It's a public tune. Anyone can record it. You turned it down. You said you didn't like it. They simply didn't want to record it with an unknown. What about my ring? No, see your lawyer. You can't copyright an ring. You're a thief and a rat. You listen to me, Sonny. Don't funny me, you rat. Right. Throw back under your rock, snake. Find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. In a lot of places, they say rock and roll was a big influence on juvenile delinquency. I 100% believe it. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. I know the, the, the lost position that you get into is the beat. Well, uh, if you talk to the average teenager of today and you ask them what it is about rock and roll music that they like, and they'll, the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat, the beat. Rock and roll has got to go. And welcome to the Screwed, Blued, and Tattooed Radio Show. This is your host, Johnny Daggers, speaking to you after a five-year hiatus. Yes, it is true, I have returned, and with me today is none other than the incredibly captivating, always exhilarating, some may even say titillating, the one and only, Fur Dixon! Dixon. Fur, welcome, and please give a big hey. hello to our radio listeners out there. Hey, hey, hey. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing very well, thank you. Fantastic. So before we get too deep into the interview, I'd like to just take a moment, and I would like to dedicate this show to a friend of yours who, sadly, we just lost, Mr. Nick Knox. Uh, just several oh. weeks back, so I would like to dedicate this show to Nick, and uh, for my condolences, um, I know that you probably have a lot of memorable stories to share, uh, but what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about Nick? Um, well, we were uh, reunited in 2015, and I had no idea what to expect, mm -hmm. except we chatted on the phone a few times, and um, about a week before I was going to visit him in Cleveland, I started getting like an email every day. And it would say, seven days till your trip to Cleveland. And that would be it. And then there'd be another one, six days, you're almost here, right? And so he started, it was, his enthusiasm was um, pretty uh, surprising to me. And so the day I was leaving, he sent me an email, and he said, you're coming today. And then he, I, I, I was up in the air, and he sent me an email, and he said, I do believe you're in the air right now. I'm going to see you soon, you know. And um, so I saw him, I think, the first day that I was in town, and it was just fantastic. It was – it was um, – he was so warm and so funny and and kind and he was he was like my uh long lost brother that I had been reunited with so you guys had lost connection for a while then after you had left the cramps and well yeah and and you know I don't, I don't think that he was the most uh tech savvy mm -hmm. 
and then he used email and stuff like that, but he wasn't on any social, um, what do you call it, social um, media. Right. And so it took a little bit of digging, and actually it was um, me with the help of my friend who um, sought, you know, sought him out and found uh, a record that he recorded on in Cleveland. What, what was that? Uh, Cheeseburger and the... I can't. I can't remember. Anyhow, so we found this record that he was on, and we contacted this record label, and they gave him my info, and um, so it just kind of went from there. So we met up at um, the Cleveland, uh, the the Beachland Ballroom in August of 2015. And he invited us down there because the Rosillos were in town and they were his long, long time friends. And um, Archie and the Bunkers. Oh, okay. And they were like his little uh, prodigy, uh, like grandson kids. And they were, you know, still kind of starting out and he was really proud of them. And um, so we went down to see that show and it was just amazing. Well, that's great that you guys got to reconnect. That's that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah. And we stayed in we stayed in touch ever since. Um, I went back and I looked in my email because it it did get kind of quiet. So the last email that I got from him was uh, like March first, which is a couple of days after my birthday, and he sent me a birthday email. So we would talk on the phone probably every I don't know a couple of months, probably. Pretty yeah. Well, that's great. And you are still here with us, and we are so pleased for that. Uh, you have so much going on in the works right now. And Did you say I'm still here? You are still here, yes. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's right. And uh, am, I, am, I, am I allowed to cuss on this? Show? You sure are. All right. Yes, there's uh, no holds barred here on uh, the Screwed, Blued, and Tattooed radio show. Um, so let's talk about the new bit. I am so excited for the What the Fuck Yushima band. Well, it's actually What the Fukushima, but mm -hmm. you can say it however you want to say it. It's fine. Yes, we get a little crazier, so we'll pronounce it correctly. The What the Fukushima. Um, so let's talk about the band and the name. Let's talk about the name. Where did you get the inspiration for the name? Uh, well, there was a, a tsunami that... Um took out a nuclear power plant in Japan in 2011 and yes. it's been spilling um, radiation into the ocean, the Pacific, at least for now, uh, for the past, what, seven years. And um, we're pretty screwed. And uh, so what else is new, right? You know? Right. Like uh, that's how we roll in this world. So every time I would see something that just was outlandish and unbelievable, I kind of just started saying, what the Fukushima? Like, what the fuck is that about? And uh, right. I don't know. I just uh, decided to uh, use it since I made it up. Well, I like it. And the title of the album is Return to Sender. So a uh, nice little Elvis homage there. Mm, uh, well, of course, I love Elvis. If you don't love Elvis, I mean, you're like got rocks in your head. But um, right, um, you know, it came it, it came from the picture, and uh, John Nikolai took the picture and he did the album art, and um, the picture looks like uh, somebody, which happens to be me, uh, dropped maybe dropped out of the sky. Okay. So uh, in a heap unconscious and it just kind of symbolizes uh you know the aliens do not want to abduct us they they fucking want to send us back so even the aliens don't touch it <laughs> well with the with the aliens there that reminds me because you've released two official videos uh you've released uh perhaps maybe more the two that i know of codine and if i was free yeah um and in the codine video it kind of reminded me a little bit of um, the day the earth stood still. Say that again? The black figure, in a way, in the video. 
kind of reminded me of the robot yeah. in the earth, the day the earth stood still. Oh, interesting. Yes. Well, the first time I saw that video, I was like, hmm, I wonder. So you had mentioned aliens and that kind of segued into uh, that thought that I had there. Um, so you guys are getting ready to head out on tour or have you already started the tour? Uh, we're going to be just getting off this. Well, we'll be sleeping a week from tonight after playing in London. So seven days from today, we'll have played our first of uh, 16, almost six, uh, 16 shows in 17 days. Fantastic. Well, I have been looking forward to this record. I, I read that it took two and a half years to record. Is that correct? Yeah, it did. I didn't plan it that way. That's how it happened. Yeah. So was it because we'll get into the other band members here shortly after the break. Was it just due to schedules or? It was, it was timing. We had to wait for our guitar player to arrive back from Spain, Bernard Yin. He was touring over there. Uh, it was passing this record back and forth between two studios. It was me being kind of picky and selective about um, the mix, and it was frustrating. But, you know, when you're doing it yourself, it just takes what it takes. And right. I was kind of unwilling to compromise. And, you know, a bunch of these yes. songs are kind of, uh, stand, you know, they're sort of, they, they all fit together, but they all required their own little treatment. Right. And so it just, it, it just, it was, it was just, it just took what it took. And I'm really glad it's done now. We received the CDs back a week ago and we're getting really great response. And um, I have a feeling that the next album will not take two and a half years. It might take six weeks. <laughs> so right, tough. right. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic album. I Desmond was kind enough to uh, send it to me last night. So fantastic album. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to ask that uh, you brought up is the fact that since you're doing it yourself and you, you know, you spend a lot of time on each song. And nowadays in the digital era, uh, a lot of people will just download a song here or there. Uh, but for the old school people, such as myself, uh, we feel that it's very important to deliver a, a cohesive album still as if we were buying a 12 inch. And uh, it sounds like that's the same type of effort that you put into recording the entire album. Yeah, and it will be a 12 inch. And, and you know, I was, I was pretty uh, surprised early into this that when we started adding um, overdubs and different sounds and stuff like that, it uh, really brought me back to kind of like my teenage years mm -hmm. and taste of being into, you know, like 1970s rock and roll. Mm -hmm. so that was kind of shocking. I had, you know, I, I took a long uh, trip away from rock and roll. And I wasn't even sure that I would ever do it again. Um, there were some... There was just a lot about it that that uh, was not happy, right. and I was very interested in leaving it all behind, like as far behind as possible. And so I did that for uh, I, I, can... I did that for a number of years. Sorry, and uh, I I went really deep into like old Americana folk music and stuff like that. I you know kept songwriting the whole time. And I just really turned my back on anything to do with, you know, electric instruments, leather jackets, right. you know, all that stuff, all that, which I, you know, for a long time, I just went, oh, it's bullshit. <laughs> and, 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 but I did get tired after a while of, you know, I really like um, interesting sounds. I really like. You know, like when I was putting this new band together and I was standing here, you know, with the ability to figure out what I wanted to do, I thought, well, I really love surf music and I really love, right. and I really love garage music. And I thought, okay, well, that narrows it down quite a bit because, you know, where do you look for people and how do you do that after you've taken like a 25-year hiatus from rock and roll, you know? Right. And it's like, 
I didn't even I didn't even know um you know, proper, I mean, all the, the pedals and amps and all that kind of stuff, I, I'm still kind of, I just set it and forget it, but it's like I'll, I have to, like, re-remember how to put all that stuff together and how I want it to sound. It's, like, very interesting. It's kind of like being um, fresh out of the gate again. Well, you had brought up a good point. You said that, it, it you know, it takes you back, getting back into a rock and roll album, and... The one thing that I wanted to mention to you is that I sense, because I've been a longtime fan of your music, um, I sense more excitement and energy from you right now yeah. than I have in quite some time. And it's a really fabulous thing. I mean, just following you on social media and uh, listening to the album and now speaking to you, you really have this sense of just this energetic presence that it's such a wonderful thing to see from you. And I want to just stick my boot up the Fuhrer's ass, you know? Right, right. <laughs> I'm so pissed. That will get... I'm so, like, I'm, I, you know, I'm pissed, right? But what good is that unless you have a channel for it? And, you know, right. I have channel fuck that guy and all of his cronies. Fuck him, you know? So... And you have spurs on those boots. What? You have spurs on your boots. Well, I don't. I I, ha, I wear my spurs on the inside. Right, right. <laughs> so anyhow, um, I have, you know, I'm 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 all fresh, man. I'm not like all burnt out on the scene, and you know, I'm just kind of like. It, well, and you look great too. The videos that I've seen of you, you look absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Well, we have good genes in my family, and. Um, you know, uh, getting off the drugs and alcohol like over 20 years ago, that didn't hurt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have a, a, a pretty optimistic attitude for the most part, but all this stuff that's going on in the world really gets me down. However, you know, I'm not going to cry about it. I'm going to make noise about it. And that's when the best music has happened. So, right. all right, we are going to go into our first break. So we are going to start off with the song, Get That Saddle Off My Back. And when we return, we're going to dig deeper into the new band. So ladies and gentlemen, fleas, gnats, and ticks, here is Get That Saddle Off My Back. Back, back, back.
Come in. Well, hi, son. What you doing, Dad? Just getting ready to start my day. By shaving? Yes. Every decent man wakes, showers, and shaves. And then you're ready to start your day? Close, but not quite. Well, what you got to do next, Dad? Well, the next thing I do is pour myself a cup of coffee. And then you start your day? Almost, son. While I enjoy my delicious cup of java... I turn on my favorite radio station, WSBAT. And then you're ready to start your day? Yes, son. Now, I am ready. WSBAT puts that extra spring in my step that I need to get to work each day. Have a good day, son. Boy, I can't wait until I grow up so that I can start my day by listening to WSBAT. Why wait? Who are you? I'm your random narrator. Whether you're young or old, WSBAT is the perfect way to start your day. Gee, thanks, random narrator. Let's have a fine welcome for a very fine talent. Welcome back, juvenile delinquents. This is your host, Johnny Daggers. And if you are just now tuning in, we are here with the ultra hip psycho Yama Mama Fur Dixon. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that ultra hip, man. I don't know about that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before the break, we were speaking to you about the new band, What the Fukushima. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the band members. Uh, you've recruited a very impressive list behind you. You have uh, Dusty Watson uh-huh. from the Sonics. Yeah. He's oh, playing boy. drums. Yeah. Uh, Paul Rosler, who I'm super excited about. The Screamers, 45 Grave, uh-huh. Jifton Damone. Yeah. Um, so you got David Provost on bass, and then you have Dave Ronsky on lead guitar, and then you're, of course, doing uh, the rhythm guitar. And of course, lead vocals. And Bernard Yin is actually the guitar player on the whole record. Very nice. So let's talk about uh, how you recruited all these guys. Uh, first was uh, Dave Provost from uh, my history back in Hollywood in the 80s. And uh, he came back into my life. I didn't even know he was living in L.A. That's the thing about Facebook. You can be friends with people. You don't have to know where they are or what they're doing or anything like that. 
he showed up at a uh, backyard party I was having, and he had his guitar with him, and he said, Piper, I'm ready to play. And I was like, well, wow. Dave. And that was, that was after 29 years. Um, so we are, we get along very well. He's a um, fantastic musician, guitar player. And um, as time went on and I figured, realized that I couldn't um, really do a great show and play bass and sing at the same time, mm-hmm. I asked Dave if he would do that. And so he playing bass in this band, and he's just fantastic. So him and Dusty together, wow. Um, they enjoy playing together. They are a powerful um, rhythm section. And so Dusty, I um, said I was doing like a investigative right. um, quest to go see the Sonic in 2015. And, you know, I know that, you know, the, the original members in the band, they were like some older guys. And I thought, well, I'm going to go check them out and see how they sound playing rock and roll. And then maybe I'll see if that's something that I can do, you know. And so I went to see the Sonics, most of the original members, um, and Duffy. And, wow, they blew my lid off. They were so fantastic. And but I, I was really um fixed on Dusty's drumming all night. He was just fantastic. Um he's he's my favorite drummer out there today. He's got old school chops, he's a hard hitter. I had no idea right. that coming out of uh quiet acoustic music I would be playing with like one of the loudest drummers out there today. But um, I can say that I uh, right. enjoy it very much, and uh, we play really well together, and he's a really nice person. Um, he's a no-nonsense kind of fellow. I just am honored, you know, to be able to share the stage with him. He's just badass. Yeah, I mean, the whole band, listening to the album, there is not one track that that I'm like, ah, uh, it just sounds like they just put this on here. I can really tell that you took a lot of time, you know, working on the songs, you know, everything from beginning to end. I, in fact, when we were trying to pick songs for today's show, I had a hard time narrowing it down to just three. Why, thank you. Yeah, I, I you know, I don't, um, I, you know, I kind of come, I was like a, a one of the younger people in this like old school mentality that you don't fuck around you play hard um you take it seriously and have fun and i just um you know i just don't i just don't want to mess around and um there is a lot of music on every track but there's also i think some economy and i always like taking stuff out if it's not necessary you know, right. but um, I I just don't like filler and there's no reason for it. And I've been waiting to do this for a long time. I mean, I have that song, Get That Saddle Off My Back. I wrote that at the end of the 80s. Wow. And I, I, I've actually played that in acoustic with, you know, uh, uh, solo acoustic with a more conservative audience and those people have been kind of like blown back against their chairs a little right, bit. Right, right. <laughs> At the end, you know. And so when I got to play that song, actually, you know, giving it the light of day with a rock and roll band, it was like, yeah, this is, you know, this has just been waiting. I've been waiting. I've had to wait for a long time to do this. So I just wanted to right. make it count. And uh, I just didn't want it to not be a perfect in um a real sense as it could be you know well so. you i mean seriously this is one of the greatest albums that i have heard in some time and the one thing that i was really excited about because i am a huge lover of the saxophone Me too, and uh though. so when some tracks would go through and the saxophone would kick in i was like oh my god she brought in a sax and it reminded me so much of you know your old days with uh the hollywood hillbillies um and so i was wondering uh that's my what's that player. that's that's my sax player from the hollywood hillbillies is that jack on the sax that's jack ruby yes. that is phenomenal 
And I hadn't seen him for 29 years that same time until 2015. Really? And he didn't end up playing on the album until 2016 or 2017. And he's going to be back in the band again. I mean, right now we've been, you know, working out the details and stuff like that. But I definitely plan on uh, pulling him in in a really short time. Like, Going to Europe right now, we're, we're playing it very uh, bare bones, and we're just doing drums, guitar, and bass, uh-huh. and me. But uh, c- coming up in the future, I definitely plan on, um, and, and Jack has also expressed that he's ready to start um, blowing some horn with us, and, and maybe even Paul Rossler, you know. Right. I mean, Paul has, Paul has a bit of a hard time getting away from his studio. But uh, I think he really likes playing with us, and uh, we get along. We're all really compatible, and uh, so I think that'll happen, too. But Jack Ruby, I mean, in old rock and roll, you had to have a sax, right? Yes, you have to. It's imperative. I mean, and, and if the sax isn't, isn't soloing, the sax is, like, doubling the bass. Right. But if you have this, like, this huge bottom that you could you know that you can't even duplicate from just having a base right i literally jumped out of my seat when the sax came on i was not expecting Uh-oh. sax i was so fucking excited i just like was like this is fantastic so and to know yeah. now that you know jack is i didn't realize he was playing the sax on this so he he will be so happy to hear that because he's been playing in some pr- very He's a very accomplished musician, like all these guys are in the band. They all read music. They all do charts and all that kind of stuff. But he's been playing in, like, a number. I had to find him. I mean, I actually went on one of these, like, people searcher sites. Yeah. Right? And, 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 I, and I got this phone number, and I called this number, and there was an answering machine with nobody on the other end. And I just said, you know, if this is Jack Ruby's, phone number if you know how to get a hold of him will you please give him my number you know mm-hmm. and probably like two months later he called me back you know so that was like kind of fantastic that is and uh, and uh so he, he's been playing in any, any number of different like um more classical or big band kind of things yeah and so he he himself said he hadn't been playing rock and roll for quite a long time wow and so uh, we just pulled it out of them, you know? <laughs> well, I love it. I absolutely love it. And, uh, you know, you had mentioned obviously working with Paul. Um, have, did you record the album at Kitten Robot Studios or? I What, I, what happened was is I started, um, we recorded the basic track at my longtime friend Dennis Moody's studio. And Dennis actually recorded all the early, ho- everything Hollywood Hillbillies did. Oh, he okay. recorded it. And so that was 84 and 85. And so I had recorded a, a couple of acoustic albums at Dennis Moody with my old partner, Steve Werner. And um, so I went back to Dennis's and did all the basic tracks because Dennis, you know, how to like mic things fantastically. And so we did that. But then I needed some more specific and quirky kinds of like sounds. Mm-hmm. So I went over to Paul for that. And also I had recorded a single, um, an earlier version of If I Was Free. And he has this microphone. Oh, my God. He has this, like, I don't know, really expensive tube microphone. Oh, okay. They don't make it And I had really great success um, recording vocals. So I ended up doing all the basic tracks at Dennis Moody's. And then I did all the overdubs and all the vocals at Paul's. And Paul, you know, he's, he's just such a comfortable person to work with that um, he just, like, kind of cajoled really great vocals out of me. Right. You know, and, um, and all the extra stuff. And he just added keyboards and parts that were just fantastic. And, um, you know, it was just so important in this record. So it was kind of... And that was part of the thing because it went back and forth a few times between studios. Like we'd get one thing finished and then I'd take it back to Dennis Moody's 
we do a little bit of editing and a little of this and that, and then it would go back to Paul. So it wasn't, you know, it, it just it just happened. This album happened the way it had to happen in the time that it took, you know. Right, and I'm sure that it was refreshing to be able to work on the album, especially nowadays with the modern technology that you can release an album without going through a label and and worrying about how everything's going to sound in post and whether they fucked up your sound that you were going for. So that makes me, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why I never um, really got into the melee of the music business because I just, ugh, that that kind of stuff just creeps me out you know i relate to have the freedom to be able to work on the album to release it the way that you want to release it because you know in your head the sound that you want that album to have yeah definitely yeah and and pretty much it's it's it's, it's all there you yeah know? most certainly yeah, yeah and uh what we're gonna do we're gonna take another break and when we return let's see let's go into how do you feel about uh taking us into code on sure go for it all right well ladies and gentlemen we will be right back with Fur Dixon, and here is Kodai. 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 Yeah. 
guys, do you like girls in corsets, stockings, bullet bras, and garters? Do you like girls with cars, vintage cars, hot rods, and rat rods? If so, then Garters and Grills is the magazine for you. Stop wasting your time by using cheap and tacky run-of-the-mill cheesecake rags to change your oil. Fuel up with the high-octane ladies of Garters and Grills. Each issue delivers maximum performance by bringing you the hottest pinups and centerfolds. Don't believe us? Then check under the hood. This month's issue features over 50 pages of sleek, streamlined beauties, including an exclusive Bonnie and Clyde-inspired photo shoot by Johnny Daggers and Jerrica Green. If that's not enough to get your engine revving, then check out our two stunning cover models, Cat Ross and Little Miss Curls. Garters and Grills, the magazine for the man who has it all but wants a little more. Issues are available in both digital and imprint formats at magcloud.com. Order your copies today. 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 Hey, Billy, do you want to come over to my house? Nah, I think I'm going to go play ball with some of the guys. Oh, come on. My parents just got a brand new Zenith 60 312 tube radio. Nah, thanks for the offer anyway. I gotta practice my swing. You want real swing? You gotta check out this radio show that I found. My mother doesn't know that I listen to it. In fact, I'm forbidden until, well, I'm actually, I'm never allowed to listen to it. Aw, uh, why doesn't she want you listening to it? It's called the Screw, Lube, and Tattoo Radio Show. Oh, uh, yeah, it's hosted by some guy named Johnny Daggers. It sounds bad. My mother said that he's a bad influence on me. You're always doing things your mummy tells you not to do. They play all this rock and roll. Rock and roll? Yeah, it's this new music. All the cool kids are listening to it nowadays. Come on. You can play baseball any day. Come over to my house. Let's listen to WSPAT. Nah, thanks anyway, but I don't want to get in trouble. If my mother finds out, I'll, I'll be grounded for a week. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna go play ball. Boy, Billy, you just wait. You wait till I tell the rest of the gang. Tell the gang that you're too afraid to listen to the radio. Hey, guys! Hey, Billy's too afraid to listen to the radio. He's afraid he's gonna get into trouble. Listen, parents. If you don't want your child to end up an outcast like Billy, then let them listen to the screwed, blued, and tattooed radio show. It'll save your child years of therapy, which you'll have to pay for. So remember, don't turn that dial. The future of America is depending on you. Welcome back, all you rock and roll neophytes. This is your howling in the moonlight nocturnal cave dweller, Johnny Daggers, and we are here with the very furry but never hairy Fur Dixon. What did you just say about me? I said you were very furry but never hairy. Oh, thank goodness. Gee. Yes, you know, <laughs> hairy. <laughs> uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard Codine, the new single. Um, and that was a song which was originally recorded by Buffy St. Marie. Yep. Um, a phenomenal cover. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the song and what inspired you to record it. Well, first of all, I have to be perfectly honest. I did, never, um, I did not hear Buffy St. Marie's version until we were in the process of recording this one. Um, okay. The version that I heard that I really, really love is done by an Austin punk rock band called Poison 13. Um, they have a great album, and their lead singer actually just passed away a few months ago, which is really sad, Mike Carroll. Um, but Poison 13 was, it, it, I mean, one of my favorite bands. And um, they put a lot of blues in their punk rock, and they uh, did the version of Codeine that I that made me want to do the song. And um, I realize there's many different versions of Codeine. That song was written in 1964. 64, yeah. So, 
Yeah. Uh, Your rendition's fantastic. I'm going to have to check out Poison 13 now because I'm not familiar with them. Definitely. Um, so that song resonates. Um, it seems to be happening right now. There's a, you know, a big uh, opiate problem in the right. country. Um, I know what kind of a slippery slope that stuff can be. I can imagine in this world how attractive uh, just checking out and going into oblivion might be for a lot of people. Right. And it's fucking serious business for me. But it's, it's just such a great um, blues song in its own way, you know? And it comes from such a pure and simple place if you hear uh, Buffy St. Marie's version. It really does. And the way that you sing it is absolutely incredible. And, and I mean, you're right with the epidemic right now. I come from a very small country town. Nowadays, that town's completely decimated with the drug epidemic. Um, and I never would have expected that in my life. Um, so, I mean, the song is just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to do it for her, you know? Uh, now, talking about the country, you, because I'm getting up there in age, I, I'm in my mid-40s, uh, you were one of the first people to ever turn me on to uh, the country, you know, blues vibe in rock and roll music. Yeah, well, um, I came from uh, Rockabilly. That was my main influence in Hollywood in the early 80s. Yes. Uh, I just it just resonated. Um, so I went from rockabilly to um, I was in a band called the Whirly Birds, and it was like rockabilly, Tex-Mex, cumbia, uh, rock and roll. It was loud. The lead singer was crazy, and he was a crooner, Dino right. Lee. And uh, when we, my boyfriend at that time, and I, um, Gary Dickstein, and I left that band. We thought, well, what are, what are we going to do? And what was happening in Hollywood at the time, there was a lot of dark and goth and white faced people. And I thought, I want to do exactly the opposite of whatever it is they're doing. <laughs> and, so, and so my idol at that time, and I didn't even really know why, but my idol was June Carter Cash. I just wanted to be like June Carter Cash. And I was, and we were listening to old uh, classic country, and I we were doing a lot of uh, Conway and Loretta duets, and mixing those in with surf instrumentals and biker instrumentals, and doing this whole like on stage shtick. We had live chickens on stage, and it was really fun. It was. Uh, it was all about day glow. I, you know, I would spray paint everybody's clothes in the band day glow colors. And I was kind of like a sort of like a punk rock Daisy May. And um, that was the band that I was playing in when we became friends with Nick, Nicky Knox. And he started hanging out with us. And he and Gary, my boyfriend at the time, had, had the Cleveland connection in common. And so they were always talking about uh, Cleveland Indians baseball and Cleveland Browns football. And we would just hang out a lot. And before you know it, Nikki um, brought Lux and Ivy to see us uh, play a couple of shows. And it kind of went from there. They asked me to be in the band. Yeah, and I mean, it makes perfect sense as to why you joined. I mean, honestly, my first introduction to Rockabilly was at a very young age when the Stray Cats came out with their first album because my dad had the 12-inch. Yeah. And uh, so that was my love, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the cramps, I heard the cramps for the first time. Yeah. And I was like, this is fucking incredible. And, uh, you know, I heard, uh, you know, Elvis covers and Carl Perkins covers. And I'm like, fuck, yeah, this is really cool. And then that made me delve back and discover the Hollywood Hillbillies, oh, um, cool. which I absolutely phenomenal. And I, I'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, but just absolutely incredible. And the one thing... In preparation for our interview today, because I always like to be very well prepared, and uh, although I've been a fan for many, many years now, thanks to YouTube and the internet nowadays, there are some things that I hadn't seen back in the day. 
Um, and the one thing was from a French television show, I believe. And you had one of the best quotes off of that that I have ever heard. And I'm going to paraphrase you here. Uh, but you said something about uh, the younger people were influenced by the older musicians playing country. So they emulated the older versions of these musicians and they lost that energy. And it's all about adding the energy to the music. And I just thought that that was so fantastic because when you look back at, you know, your previous bands, the Hollywood Hillbillies and the Cramps and so on, you have, you were a ball of energy on the stage and you still are. So I still am. Definitely. You still are. And that's fantastic because not many people can keep the energy up, you know, after what? 40 year career. Well, I, I, career? I have been in a little bit of obscurity. I've been like getting lots of rest. I've been getting prepared for this. So, you know, like when I, I had, I had my son in uh, 1990. And so I kind of took a little side detour and uh, I've just been figuring that after he was grown, I was going to come out of retirement, and that's exactly what I'm doing. That was the plan, and the plan is happening. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, there's a rumor going around that you're working on a memoir. Oh, yeah, I am, definitely. Yep. It's, uh, I am super interested in this. Oh, yeah. That, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's about my life, and that, you know... Uh, my, I guess my idea of normal is not so normal. And I'm sure many of us have, you know, had that same kind of experience. I'm sure many of us have had interesting lives. But um, a lot of that early lifetime and everything uh, intersects with uh, my 1986 uh, tour with the Cramps, mm -hmm. which was really interesting and really insane and 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 a lot of it had to do with just the world events things that were going on then right because uh right when we got over there um the united states bombed libya and that kind of threw everything into a bit of chaos and yes. the day after um the u.s bombed libya there were anti-American uh, anti demonstrations in every city that we went to play in. Wow. And so we drove through these really gnarly, like, police barricades, and there was people out in the streets, and there was all this, like, chanting at the shows. They were going, fuck you, Americans, fuck you, Americans. Right, oh, wow. Uh, you know, it was just, it was a lot of melee, you know? And that, yeah. went on, that went on through the German portion of the tour. And then from Germany, we went, we had a short stop in Switzerland, and that was pretty civilized. But then we went to Italy, and Italy was, like, insane. And there were wow. riots going on, and they were, like, throwing stuff, like they were ripping chairs up and throwing them on the stage. You have to stop the show. And um, so that went on for a good few weeks. And then we finally were leaving Italy, going to France, and Chernobyl blew up. Wow. And that was really sobering. And I was really frightened. I was 24 years old. And I said to the rest of the band, I said, uh, so there's like this nuclear power plant that might be melting down and all that. And are we going home? And they're like, no, we're going home. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh, okay. But it just, there was this tension that um, happened during that tour. And a lot of things just kind of went awry and went off the rails. And it turned out to be just a really incredible story. Right. That, um, you know, I've told to a few people many times. And when I uh, met my sweetheart, John Nikolai, um, in 2013, he said to me, you know, you really should think about like putting this all down in a memoir. It's just so damn interesting. It's like a roller coaster ride. And so he's actually started helping me um, put it together. And we have about, I don't know, close to about 250 pages. 
and there will be some more. And and so basically, you know, he's wanted to work on this book while I've been making this album, and I just couldn't focus on two things at once like that and have a day job. Right, of course, yeah. So got the album done, and I want to put a little bit of concentrated time into just going through it and finishing it up, and uh, hopefully in 2019 I'll have a book. Now, are you going to seek a publisher for the memoir, or are you going to self-publish? You know, that really depends. Um, I'm I'm pretty leery about, you know, big publishers. Right. I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I myself, I don't know. I, I You know, if, if, if I know me, I'd probably self-publish, and then I just, you know, I just don't want to compromise. Right. And um, have to leave aspects out because there's, you know, certain kind of clauses about, you know, litigate. I don't know. Ugh. Understandable. Well, I kind of got super excited when I heard about the memoirs because I started thinking about all kinds of things in my head. I'm like, wow. Um, let me ask you this, because being a huge Hollywood, going back to the Hollywood Hillbillies again, um, I feel like. Was there a lot of material that you guys never got to cut in the studio? I don't know, because thinking about the memoirs, I was like, wouldn't it be great if she self-released it and then she included a disc with it that had all these old songs that nobody has ever heard before. It's kind of like a little bonus disc to go along with the book. Well, there's an album, and uh, I, you know, I didn't remember because it was such of a haze back then, but we uh, were actually offered a um, record deal. And um, one of the guys in the band was had a rough night the night before, and we were in the office negotiating this deal, and he was in the other room, like, throwing up into the garbage can. And <laughs> I, I heard $18,000, and I was, like, 23 at the time, thinking, $18,000 isn't going to change my life any. And, uh, <laughs> and so... Here's this album, and it's done, and uh, I think basically it just needs to be mastered. It's already been transferred from tape, and so one of those one of these days we'll put it out, and it might be in 2019 too. I mean, you know, why not? That would be phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, I had no idea that you had actually cut a, a full length, so that's that's really exciting. Well, that was news to me until I, it was reminded. <laughs> Oh, oh boy those were the days yeah okay so this is about the end of the show um let's give some tour dates to our fans out there well i have tour dates on my website uh for dixon.com and also on facebook we're going to be spending uh well we're going to have six shows in the uk starting on july 12th beginning in london and ending on the 17th in Brighton. And I'm really excited about this. I've had dreams about going back to the UK. I have lots of uh, friends who I've been on Facebook now with for about 11 years, and they keep saying, when are you coming? And I'm like, well, these days, I'm going to get over there. And uh, we put on a really great, exciting show, and... Uh, so I just can't wait to get it out there. And then we're going to be traveling on the 18th to uh, Spain. We're going to be playing a festival in the north uh, of Spain at the beach called the uh, Motor Beach. And I think the Rizzolos are going to be playing there, some other bands. I love the Rizzolos, I have to say. I have to always promote the Rizzolos. And uh, so we're going to be in Spain for nine shows, and then we're going to come home and then in September, we're going to play some shows in the Bay Area. We just booked a couple of those. And I don't know after that because we really need a proper booking agent. And we might end up doing some shows in Texas and uh, Arkansas, possibly in Oklahoma. So we're working on that, too. Well, hopefully we can get you out to the East Coast because I'm in Baltimore, and we would love to oh see you. Oh, my God. I love that. I would love to come home. I'm, I'm, that's where I'm from. So, yes. So hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, we will see you. Uh, so, when did you say you're coming back from the UK? Uh, we'll be back on July 29th. 
so. July 29th. Okay. So once after the end of July, after you play some West Coast dates, uh, maybe we will see you out here. Yeah, it's probably uh, going to happen sooner than later. Fantastic. Well, thank you, for It has been a blast and an honor, and you are welcome to join us on the show anytime you would like. Thank you, Johnny. I really appreciate that. You're awfully nice. Not a problem. We are going to end the show by going into another track off the new album, which is... My baby, go diving. Oh, right on. Hey. Another one of my many favorites. So, ladies and gentlemen, Fur Dixon, my baby, go diving. 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 And that concludes our show. So I want to give a big thank you to Fur Dixon. What a lovely lady. I absolutely adore her. She is so sweet. So thank you for listening. We'll be back next month. This is your host, Johnny Daggers, and you are listening to the Screwed, Blued, and Tattooed radio show right here on WSBAT.